You laughed too much, brother. Okay, okay, man, okay. Yeah, I was just, I didn't know where you were going with it. No. I was going to let you land it. I was trying to see where my laugh intro could go in comparison to your laugh intro. You got to squeeze the diaphragmatic breath, you know, uh, you got to get that in. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? How Dude, you doing? I'm doing good. Sorry I wasn't here last week. I, uh, How did I got, it go? I didn't actually get to Everything went out to me. Yeah, it was a good, was a good oh, week. Yeah. I just didn't get a week on the radio. I got a week off. What week happened? Week life, what happened? Things are good. Yeah, things what are happened good. last week? So tell tell the crowd like what was going on. What was your, what, why, why were you here? Why did you, details. yeah, well. Keep a lot of details. It's just something to do with some legal things I got going on. And so Crawford's not in trouble. Done. It's not that kind of legal. Not in trouble. Was, no, uh, no, no. The, 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 we'll get to it later time in the show, probably. Maybe at a different time. Shout me out as an interview sometime. We should. Should because they don't know who this Crawford guy is. So Who's this Crawford? this guy uh, he's is a settlement for the last like what seven six seven years of your life, right? Like, like six years. There's yeah, an like accident. Years, probably, yeah. He was thrown out of the car. Yeah, he big deal. Like, he literally died seven. Uh, every eight eight old, that's yeah. ridiculous, man. So, but he's blood, here with us, blood, man. And Drivewire is grateful for that, man. I'm grateful, grateful for that. So so I want to get into Drivewire's purpose, and then I want to get into who's on our show. Today, so huge guest. Uh, the instigator. What is what's the deal? So Drivewire exists for a sole purpose of helping artists get paid on their art. Um, I am the more I'm looking into this, I'm reading huge amounts of marketing. I'm reading huge, massive, massive, massive amounts of reaching out to people, how to actually gain cash flow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Boring ass stuff. Why does it matter? Because Important. dude, there are so many artists who are super, super talented, but they're not earning enough. And I mean like not earning almost at all, at all. despite Anything. despite truly being gifted. Yeah. And I've seen it so many times, and I mean literally on the hundreds now, yeah. and it started to get under my skin to a level where it's I was bothering. like, okay, despite the fact that I'm not rich and doing this yet, I am going to decide to find a way with the help of other people in the industry, the people working. in this room, specifically how to help artists earn on their art. It doesn't have to be through just going through, okay, getting it online, getting streams, getting, it can also be, we're gonna start talking about specific strategies like affiliate marketing, creating content and giving a shout out to specific uh, things that you actually use. Look, I, I, I really believe that the creative people the creative people, you guys, the creators who are trying to earn on art, whether it's music or, or visual art or, or communication or literacy or any of those creative people, you guys are the rich people of the new generation, the new communication, the new economy. I really believe that. And I would love for DriveWire to be the catalyst for how to do it. And we're going mad. Like we're contacting as many people as possible literally CEOs of company, that. right? Major artists who have already Other done it, people. up and coming bands. We've had up and coming people who have made the plunge from, from being a, 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 a employee to making the plunge into an entrepreneurship in the arts and they're actually swimming, they're treading water, actually they're making progress. That's huge. And today I'm ridiculously excited to tell you that we have a, a man who's going to be in the studio. He's not here yet. But but He's on his way. you will understand why in a second. So his name is Paul Sanderson. He is, in my opinion, um, maybe I'm gonna get squashed for this later, but he's the best music lawyer in Toronto, okay? The guy's pedigree is absolutely insane. He's been in law for 35 years. The man, let's see if I can actually find it. So this guy is most frequently recommended, okay, on, on Lexpert or Canada's legal directory as the most frequently recommended entertainment lawyer. He's been listed in best lawyers in Canada for 2007, 2010, 2011. He's also been the author of two of the books in Canada and his books that he's written have actually been cited. I believe, I believe it's at the Supreme Court level which means that he's actually legitimately helped to shape the law and how we see music and corporate law here. So we're gonna have him in the room. We're gonna be asking him questions directly. Some of the questions that I have are like, look man, what are something that artists commonly do that's annoy you, that annoys you or that's really stupid? Like, 
What can we stop doing to get ourselves in so much trouble legally? What are some things we can do to protect ourselves? How do you protect yourself? Where are people getting screwed? Dude, where? I also want to know what his story is, why he went into law. And, and, and also, my favorite question that I'm really excited for is what's the sneakiest clause you've ever seen in a contract? So I, he's going to be here. He's, he's giving me a couple of hints at what his answers might be via email before the show. And I am, I'm vibrating with excitement to get him in the room to have this conversation. He's in a little bit of traffic. Toronto, as you know, deserves an eight lane on either side. Highway, everyone in the room is nodding because we all know that it's trash. He got the unfortunate side of that. It's a problem with a 5 p.m. show. Nobody's fault. We're going to go to a music break and hopefully, just hopefully, we have the universe on our side and he's on the, on the air by the time you guys come in. We have Panic Attack by the Glorious Sons and No Reply by The Beatle showing up here on Drivewire at CFRE. Blast. Welcome back to Drive Wire Radio. So we are, is in house. We are indeed lucky. I said at the very, very end, lucky. if we're lucky by the end of that music break, we actually have the Paul Sanderson in-house. Paul, I'm just going to let you know, get up and close and personal to the microphone because it will not pick you if you're uh, the voice, the so the low tones, you might, you might miss out. Okay, this man is a bit of a legend. I don't think he would call himself a legend. Most people don't want to call themselves a legend. Uh, you're more than doing, welcome to like, don't wanna, turn it up and sure. down, though, if you want to point it. <sighs> don't want to appreciate themselves, no, which is so much to appreciate. You're a legend, my friend, and so you usually just means you're old enough to be called. <laughs> <laughs> I was not going to go that. We were not going down that road. Not at all. Thank you. So, so here I have a question. Right in your bio, it says leading writer on legal aspects of Canadian music law and visual arts. Does that mean that you literally help write the law? Is that what you what you mean by that? Uh, no, uh, it means I've. Uh, probably written more and clearly have written more legal publications in the field than anyone else. So wow. as a lead but I don't I don't invent the law. I only state what the law is. I don't even project what it might want it to be. Gotcha. You state what it literally mind. is. Yeah. Would yeah, yeah. there be legal implications for projecting what you think it might be? Is that well it's a, <laughs> it, it can be a bit of a you know um, uh, a situation where you know, it's it's fun to do, but it's 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 not really what applies. It's private. It's In the end, would that be wrong? It'd be considered. Would you? No, it wouldn't no, be wrong. No, no. I it's just more I could, philosophical. More, yeah. Or, so, well, the books themselves were meant to be practical guides, like the Musicians in the Law, uh, which is now in its fourth edition. It was meant to. It, it really answers only one question. It takes seven hundred pages, but what is the law that affects musicians in the music business affairs? End of story. So the one question. Entire book answers that question. <laughs> it's such an important question at that. Yeah, it's a very broad it's, question. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, I want to get into your story and how you ended up, because you're highly prolific as an artist as well. So you have uh, The Blue Room is your band, you have with your fourth book of poetry, you have CDs, you have inserts like you. So did you start artsy and go towards law, or were you always like really analytical and artistic? I think you you may be right. It may be in both of them may have been there from the get go. But my orientation was to start and want to be a full time guitar player after high school, and spent three years in the trenches trying to do that before I went under, into undergrad. I never intended to go to undergrad, and then of course um, after two years, which you could do when I went to school, I got into law school. Wow. What, what was your undergrad for? What was it for? Yeah, political science and history. Any particular reason, or you just were like, eh? Yeah, no, no. I was very focused at that point. After spending three years in what I call the University of Modern Knox, three years of you know, trying to make it as a musician, there, there's my BA, right? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, then you get very focused, and you go, if I'm going to work on plan B, if plan A didn't work, plan B has to work. So I was very focused. I went into undergrad with the idea of getting the best marks I could, which is very competitive to get in law school. And I looked at what I did in high school and said, well, what were some of my best marks? History was one of them. So I had uh, 
I majored in political science with a minor in history. Did you have the plan for law before the undergrad? So you were like, yes. okay, undergrad. Yes, so you kind of were like, let me ring the game yeah. to get as high marks as I can. What do I love? Let me do that for two years. Is that kind of? Right. Yes. Cool. Yeah. All right. So I like that you had the plan. So give, give yourself the upper hand advantage right off the bat. Right. See, so yeah, that's a, that's a genius idea. A genius well, plan. sure. And you know, there are a lot of people in undergrad and in law school for that matter that aren't very focused on what they want to do. Do you, now, do you think, like, I guess, just a, again, a broad opinion, do you feel like those people are just pressured into making choices that they might not be ready to, do you think? Or well, you maybe not focused as you were? I think it was a, a bit of an anomaly. It's unusual to be that focused. But like I said, it was the three years that did it. And, and again, if you're going right into undergrad from um, high school because your parents want you to go, yeah, uh, my parents didn't force me to go to undergrad. Oh, right on. So that was a totally, that was your no, choice. It no, was what you wanted to do. It was your, yeah. your wanting to doing. I and wanted to get a, of getting your butt kicked by the streets. <laughs> <Yeah. and laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. So fun, real fun, odd jobs. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's something that I've always said. So I actually went to this school, UTM, before I went to Metalworks. And both times yeah. my failing was that I didn't have a plan first. So I, what I say to people is like, if you're going to go to school, just know what you want to do after. Yeah. Because then I can say, okay, I want to be a lawyer. I got to go to law school, so I have to go through poli sci and history to get to law school. Yeah. It takes away the question of why am I learning this? Yes. You yeah. know what I mean? Versus the kid who's just in school, doesn't know what they want to do. Well, why am I learning this? I don't know. And then you get, and yeah. I was depressed. I didn't like any of it. I didn't have, yeah. well, and, and it was just coming down to a meet, like a loss of purpose, like a meaninglessness. Yeah. That, I really was like, why do I have all this knowledge? I felt like a mental hoarder. Like I had all this stuff up here, but what am I doing? Yeah. yeah. So I really appreciate that you planned first. Yeah. Well, the idea was to get, and what was eventually worked out to be, a, my own patron of the arts. So that would be me, right? So I can afford now to dabble, and it is seen as dabbling because I'm not doing it full time, but hopefully doing it at a, at a you know at least a semi-professional level. So if you're not you know, if someone isn't going to fund it, then how are you going to do it? Yeah, how do you do it? So yeah, you kind yeah. of found a way to be as prolific as possible so that you could afford to kind of back up and do all this artistic stuff that you're doing on the back end? That was it. I like stuck, that. Was, stuck with it. was it worth it? Oh, well, that's a very good question. You pay a very high price for whatever you do. So could I have made more money in law doing something, working in another field? Yes, absolutely. Could I have continued to pursue the artistic pursuits as deeply and widely as they have? No. Mm -hmm. No. Interesting. So what, there's a trade-off. There's always yeah, a price you pay. Yeah. Sacrifice. That is a hell of a deep answer. I appreciate your honesty on that one. That was really good. Um, why law in the first place for you? Because <laughs> I'm not good at fixing small engines. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Hey, my dad was. Yeah. I, I, so, so I looked at the time. Right back. I looked at yeah. I looked at, at the time of potentially going to uh, like a community college, and I went. Eh, hmm. I looked at all the course selections and went, that isn't really me. I'm kind of more of a heady guy, and I said, yeah. I'm going to compromise now, which it is, and change courses. I want to shoot as high as I can. So at that point, a law degree was. I think even more valued than it is now because of the increased competition. That's another story altogether. But uh, and I, you know, I was no good in sciences. Don't like the sight of blood. So a doctor is doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have been not sure. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> so uh, I don't want to do no brain surgeries. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm not into it. <laughs> so, wow. Interesting. Hey, yeah, I like that. I like that. It said. Yeah. Uh, it said on your bio, hopefully the bio is accurate and true. Is <laughs> something along the lines of like, you wanted to protect artists, is that oh, yeah. where yeah. we're say, and, and helping people with the law, right? Like, it's got to be such a good rewarding feeling. Yes, yeah, that, that definitely is part of that, hence artist legal advice services. Right, right, and, which, um, which we'll bring up. And, and of course, now. you're in the, it, it's not like, if you see a lot of people that are in charities or philanthropical, uh, you know, endeavors, they're often, you know, they, let's say, for example, they're, they're into helping, uh, you know, find a cure for cancer. Often somewhere in their history, maybe their own, or certainly in the family, someone suffered from cancer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Not that music is cancer. It's not, it's <laughs> no, no, no. But, no, but, no, but no. if you've been in the but trenches and you start seeing other people like yourself saying, yeah, they're, they're being taken advantage of. So, so what can we do to help that? To help and, 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 
you know, law is a profession too. It's not just a business. So yeah, you're gonna make your living from it. But, but you're there to help people. Yeah, so I like why not work with people you like and want to work with? It's so interesting that you say that too, because the genesis of this show was going to Metalworks and then seeing I was saying literally before you showed up here, hundreds of people who are truly some of the most talented, talented musicians people. in Canada working at a minimum wage job that they don't love. Yeah. And then they go home after eight hours and they're too tired to do the thing that uh, they love. And then right, 10 right, years right, later, they give up on the thing and, it, and they end up killing itself because yeah. they just didn't have the weight. Yeah, yeah. So with this, we're, we're searching feverishly by having people on and asking them, look, what can people do to maybe earn on their art? And if we can create strategies and sure. bring it to them, perhaps we can help in that plight maybe as directly as you. So that's really interesting yeah. that the genesis for this was the same. Well, my, my interest there mainly is obviously getting better deals, mostly contracts, but I do some corporate trade. When you say better deals, you sent that in the email. You're yeah. like, I asked you, I think, why why get a lawyer in the for like, what does a musician sure. need? And one of the things you said, like you said now, was well, negotiating better deals, what are, how do you upgrade the deal? Like, what's different that you oh, would get that I might that's, not get? That's this earning stuff? the artist more money off the deal, correct? Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, at the end of the day, at this, and how to put this without sounding like it's all about the money, because it often is. It's all <laughs> about the money. Yeah. Artist rights really have some monetary value. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's what, what it boils down to. So getting a better deal is knowing, you know, if you can ask for higher royalties, or better events, uh, you know, is there anything by way of re release commitments, reversions on record deals? If you don't know to ask, then you're likely, and studies have shown, if you've negotiated a deal, you're more likely to recoup and therefore have actual real earnings, rather as if you simply sign a deal put in front of you, if, if you're lucky, and it's not a disaster deal, then, then you're, you may not ever recoup or recoup as fast. So how would I ever know to ask for those things? Uh, well, you you could read things like my handbooks or my book, and there's other authors out there in the field uh, that, that have written a lot of books. But it often makes sense to do it in conjunction with either management and skilled counsel. So get a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone who's known, and ideally someone who specializes. Don't go to your uncle or your aunt. Who practices real estate law? That's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Got you. They're not going to know. They're not going to know. Real estate law is not the same no. as or yeah, criminal or family. For that. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Highly special. The other thing that's tricky in this field is, uh, is uh, what people don't know is that often what's not in the deal is even more important than, than what's in it. So f the reason I pointed was Fran had me write this question down. He's like, the, one of the biggest things I remember that Paul always said in class was it's what's not in the contract is more almost as important as what's in it. So can you elaborate yeah, yeah, on sure. that? What do you mean? Sure. Well, there are industry customs and, and terminology that that are, um, if you're in the industry, they're, they're, they're commonplace and maybe even self-explanatory. But the one that, that I look at mostly where which isn't in the table is, or on the table, if you, especially if you're working with a small independent, are you sharing in, in uh, a, 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 either a percentage or a share of what are called foreign advances? So often the way the deal works is there's a smaller production company that pays for the record and then they shop it around and they're looking for usually a larger third party to finance the rest of the, uh, the um, you know, the recordings, and the question is, does, does the artist share in that or not? That well, would be not the in the yeah, yeah, unless you negotiate it in. So let's say, for example, well, you did yeah, a record well, for a few thousand dollars, whatever, and then you collect, again, this just put a hypothetical number, a hundred thousand dollars while you live in advance. The artist goes, well, shouldn't I get some of that? Well, not necessarily, depending on the way the deals. Ask and you shall receive, right? You have to put it in there. You have to negotiate wow. it. And, and that may or may not be something you can achieve, but you can certainly know to ask. If you don't know, you won't you know want to be asking. Yeah, you won't So, uh, so, so then, that, then that splits on the wording, the semantics, the details of that. You need to look at the wording, especially on a net receipts deal, whether or not that includes advances. Maybe not. 
huge. So yeah. it's a big issue. It's it's so it matters a lot. So like that's so small, yeah. I would miss that for sure, Paul. Yeah. Well, because you look at it and you go, oh great, 50-50 net receipts. Yeah. yeah. What's, Wait, what's, what's obvious? Yeah. It's not obvious. It's not. It's no. Oh, man. So is there any way aside from just bashing your head against the wall trial and error and getting hit and man, as many, like just you get hit and you learn, you're like, oh man, that's what I'm gonna have to look for next time. Is I got screwed, but let's go forward. Let's, you know, like. So you start reading these legal books? Is that what you're recommending? Like educate well, yourself on educate that? yourself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you want to be careful. You can't, I mean, you need to spend time being a musician too, right? So um, I think you need to know the basics and you could ask and you could stick your hand up and know when to bring that in for this part of your team. That's really what it is. <laughs> That's such a good end. When, but when do you bring it in? Uh, well, bring what in? I mean, that, that that relevant point would be when there's a deal on the table. Got you. So that so once you start getting deals, then you got to say, okay, let's look this over with the best advice I can possibly find. Is that kind of maybe the yeah, the sure, sure. sure. Try try and build that into your budget. What I often see, and it is a mistake. Um, you spend all your money on the production, and then it comes time for promotion and legals, and nothing. there's nothing left. Yeah, it's going but records don't sell themselves yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's usually some marketing scheme and you gotta try and get the best deal you can before you sign it because once it's signed it's too late yeah once depends one depends on contract signatures there it's everything's done deal and we're we're good to go and that's the way it goes that's the way it goes you're over 18 and you know you're yes. deemed to be of the age majority you're bound by it yeah yeah unless there's some reason to strike it down but that's a whole other set of legal issues you now what would be i guess i I want to come back to the, the other point of going at getting in contact with somebody when you feel necessary as when a deal is kind of approached is there a certain size of you know of, of popularity that would be with the of a certain group maybe to get an approach for a deal in which that would be kind of a important to discuss or it really could just be kind of as you said earlier like just an independent record I, company I, I would do it in any deal you know there's a saying and it's, I wish I invented this, uh, or, <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we appreciate that. But I'm gonna use it, because it, it's nothing but an autograph without getting your legal counsel look at it. It's very good advice. I know it sounds self-serving for the legal community, but it's it's a good advice. Yeah, because that signature really means so yeah. much, it means everything. Well, yeah, yeah. and in, in your early career, you sign something, and then you regret it many years later, if there's any money there at all. If there's money there, for yeah, sure. If yeah. there's a commercial value, if not, then okay, fine. But it still can come back to haunt you years later because what you sign, you're bound by. I mean, I'll give you an example. One of my clients came into my office with a, I mean, this is like, with a record deal that was signed 20 years before. And they're, oh, wow. the artist and the label are now arguing about it. 20 years is still a contract, though. It's it never, still it binding, never ends. Yeah. yeah. It, it, that's the deal, so. Yeah. <laughs> So okay, let's look at what the deal yeah, points say. Do do you see that a lot? Where uh, like people end up coming into those those sometimes. situations where it's like yeah. it was a long time ago and I never thought of it. Yeah, yeah. What are some common foresights? Because, so I'm just running myself through the situation. Like okay, I have this deal and I sign it and I think everything's good. And for two decades, everything is good. Yeah. And then twenty years later, yeah. something's Some not good. Wrong. Yeah. And now I have yeah. to look at this stupid <laughs> contract again. So it, it happened a lot when the internet came. In. Right? Because really? a lot of those early contracts didn't anticipate that technology. Streaming, downloading, right. so things of that What sense. am I going to get paid? Yeah. Is it a sale or is it a license? Whoa. Those, those got severely litigated with lots of well-known people like the Allman Brothers, Eminem, which is Eminem was front of that, one, yeah. for example. Was it a download, a sale, or was it a license? Big difference, because if it's a license, you get 50-50 net. If it's a sale, you get royalties, which are much less. Oh. Damn. Y2K wasn't the crashing of the internet. It's, uh, you know, it was no. the crashing no, of the no, contract. Not that too. <laughs> so are there, are there it common? <laughs> Sorry, it's okay. We survived. We survived. It, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm done with it. I'm done with it. Are there common things to look out for? Like, was it? So you can't predict the onset of some innovation like the internet. Obviously, no, 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 no you no, can't. Yeah, that was. But 
are there common ones that you see a lot where you're like, oh man, anybody would have just told you not to do that? Like, is there a lot of, that people fall into that you see? Or? Uh, like streaming websites, like that, I've seen like that has taken off huge over the past like five to six years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did a lot of people ever expect that where, you yeah, know, you can sure. readily stream my music as many times as you want yeah. all day. Yeah. Yeah, well, the idea is to get paid for that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if there's some monetary value there, yeah. That's where I was going to go next. So, payments. You said straight up, I don't really like to guess where the law is going to go and all. No. So, I'm, well, but, I'm, but I'm happy to, if you want to. Do you I'm, see I'm a way that. It's just not on my book. Do you see a way that somebody might be able to rectify this whole. Sh what was it? Uh, you sent me, I think it was Pharrell had like millions of stream of what happy right yeah, and he got song. paid like just a few thousand yeah. bucks yeah, for yeah. it yeah. do you see a reconciliation between that or do you, or do you think artists are going to have to start like okay this is my streaming site comes Maybe straight to me that. or like yeah. you know what i mean is there do you uh, see anything like that in the future well it's interesting on that note there already is a, a somewhat middle ground model um I was reading an article with the owner of Cobalt just yesterday, who was in the music business world. And I highly recommend that's a free. Um, Cobalt? Yeah, it's a, what a daily. Block. Yeah, M MBW, music business world. Anyway, it was, uh, he was talking about how they're aiming for the middle ground and taking less percentages and promoting the, and trying to build the so called <coughs> artist middle class, which is now dissipating because streaming's force you, you know, with fractions of cents to have artists that used to make reasonable livings through hard physical recordings, right. to, um, you know, to uh, be in a situation where the one percenters are doing fine, thank you, but the majority are not. So what you, they're trying to reestablish the middle class by cutting out some of the middlemen and, and charging different percentages. Interesting. No, no, you'll, you'll say, go ahead, David. That was... But there's all sorts of models. I mean, that you should look at some of the um, recent amendments, suggested amendments to the Comfort Act. And if some of those were implemented, it would go a long way. The Comfort Act? Copyright Act. Yeah. Copyright Act. Yeah. What, uh, what are some of them? Like, what's what's coming up? Well, um, removing the uh, the use of the, uh, the safe harbor provision would be... Oh. Um, Sorry, I'm the ignorant guy here. What's the safe harbor provision? Why, well, why are we going to remove it? Right now, um, the digital service providers, the so-called DSPs, uh, as long as they're just merely a conduit, they're, they're not in, under our jurisdiction. They merely need to respond to a notice and give someone notice. So you can't really turn off the tap, if you will. Um, if that was strengthened and removed, and, and you know, you could you could um, ensure that people were getting paid, and, and some of the uh, the piracy, which is still happening in the streaming, you would think not with the nine ninety nine, you know, all you can consume menu, <laughs> yeah. but so a lot of people still don't want to pay that, yeah. so yeah. it's still ripped off. So. Spotify got me for the ninety nine cents for three months, and that was just like, oh, I'll <laughs> give you the buck, I'll give you the dollar, but then well, see, comparison, that's so minimal. Like I'll buy the CDs, yeah. I'll support the artists. Yeah. those streaming services i just have such a hard time with wanting yeah. to give them my money so to get yeah. the music i i just want to go to, you sent this email and i asked you are there any um precarious or ingenious ways of monetizing and you you said yes to precarious i'm going to come back to that but uh -huh. for ingenious you mentioned uh i think her name was amanda something and oh, you were like oh, yes, amanda, palmer. amanda palmer it was like building relationships yes. and relationship equity you mentioned that there was an example there i'm not i'm not familiar with amanda palmer what? oh um well i i read a lot and i um, i'm particularly keen on biographies and autobiographies i listened to her audiobook in the car and um, she's probably one of the leading um what can i say um, examples of the new relationship based model she has about 25,000 hardcore fans worldwide, and they basically allow her to do her art. How, um... Now, she developed that slowly over the years. Is there, is there a... Yeah, uh, of course. One of the things we talk about on the show is like, dude, this is going to take you a long time. Yeah, if yeah, you're right. building a, a momentum, or if you're trying yeah. to build a business, it's going to take you many years. Yeah. So, what? Uh, how is she... 25,000 people in the grand scheme of things is not really that huge. 
But she has. Well, are you saying it's over a million point two dollars? So it's the depth of the, 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 the relationship. Yes. Yes. How did she make that? Well, it took years of touring and developing her email list and gotcha. being really there for her. So it's connecting with fans. people, right? Yeah, yeah. like being yeah. able to like get, there's a big thing. So they care. Was, I mean, they care. Yeah. The same people that she's scout surfing with become, you know, people that Thank really want to help her. Yeah. So she, she, they, you know, they, they develop rapport, they become friends over time, you know. She always, she always describes it like in, you've heard in past terms as being like a shaman, um, which is kind of a, if you will, a, 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 a not a medical doctor, but a, but more of a spiritual, spiritual doctor, doctor. Yeah, that's where I would go. With where it. yeah, where you're you're kind of a gatekeeper and you help people on the spirit level. And music does that, of course. So for sure, she, she sees herself as a modern day shaman. Really? That's yeah. cool. I never would have thought yeah. we would start talking about the show. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's that's that's. But, but there's a price to be on that too, because I mean. When she lives in Boston, and uh, and again, I don't want to misquote her or anything, uh, but my understanding was she was very involved in the Boston, when the massacre happened oh, at the Boston, uh, at the, yeah, at the, at the uh, Boston Marathon. So that just nearly, you know, caused a breakdown of her. Absolutely. Because wow. everyone was relying on her emotionally, right? Yeah. yeah. So there's a price paid there too. It's not free. You're serving, right? And Yeah. And there's He's giving something back. Simon Sinek's version of that is like, okay, well, we give the leader first choice of, of made and first choice of like meat, of the food, but we're expecting them to run yeah. towards the lion when there's a lion, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're the strongest, so they got to protect right. the rest. Yeah. There's a price paid it's, to it's a bit like that. Yeah. Totally everything, yeah. I mean, Again, it's, a, it's a fascinating autobiography if anyone's looking to, to really build an independent uh, uh, fan base. It's a good place to start. That was Amanda Palmer. Yeah. It's, um, what kind of, is she, was she a musician? Yeah, she's a musician. What kind of music? Songwriter. Uh, I would call it um, uh, almost like cabaret rock. Cool. Oh, cabaret yeah, rock. Cabaret rock. We yeah. yeah. had some Amanda Palmer on the show, Don. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, the that uh, ukulele going, that sort <laughs> okay. of thing. Okay, very I'm down with it. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not she started off as a performance artist in the park. She spent four years being a statue. Just in a wedding dress. Whoa. She said I learned tons from that and applied that to what I did as a, and what I do as a musician. Yeah. Wait, people watching. Hard to, yeah, hard to believe. How much, cool. like, some, the, you're not, I don't know if you'll have the answer for this one, but it begs the question. Not for everyone. <laughs> what is there, what is there to be learned of being a statue? You know what I mean? Like, that's a hell of an interesting thing. You're saying, look, she was a statue for four years and she said she learned all this stuff and he or she is standing in the same spot the whole time. So I'm, I don't know, that's really cool. That's now she's the statue that everyone looks to. You have to read her book to get it. I, I'd be, I'd be, I think, uh, <laughs> I don't want to mistake her, but yeah. It, it, Patience is one thing. Get the book, people. Get the book, people. <laughs> Four years of standing in the same spot. She's made yeah. of something. She's but, out of a well, different spot. She ended up making more. She was working as a coffee barista somewhere in Boston. And she started <laughs> experiment, <laughs> experimenting with it. I don't know if it was there. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> more of something more local. I don't know. And she uh, ended up, when she was busking like that, uh, she made more money than she was making per hour. Yeah. She was making minimum wage. She went, wow, this is for me. That's awesome. That's cool. I'm down with that. I'm down with that. Okay. Whatever way, right? Whatever this way. man has yeah. is clearly a wealth of knowledge. We have the Paul Sanderson here. We're going to a short music break. We got two songs coming. We have Manish Boy by Money oh, wow. Waters. Oh, and right. we got You're the One by Greta Van Fleet. Check us out. All right. Drive Wire, CFRB Radio with the great Paul Sanderson. To CFRE, it's Crawford and Carter. So, I just like maybe it would work. Maybe it would. that's our whole method. That's our whole stretch. So I'm getting my mind blown by this guy. He's ridiculously knowledgeable. We spoke about like you, you knew about the root. You talked about blues. You talked about throwing uh, not just a twelve bar blues. We got eight bars. We got eight bar, six. Um, I wanna I wanna plug a couple of the things that you're doing because uh, a, okay. a lot of people sometimes I think they imagine lawyers are just really greedy and uh, <laughs> always always out for themselves. Really? Not about trying to say, help the people there at all. You did say earlier 
here it's all about the money, but maybe this is out of context at this point. Um, <laughs> you're doing a lot of cool things that are actually free, and I want I, I want to give it back yes. to you because it's really yeah. cool to see. Um, well, even I'm sure that it wasn't free at Metalworks, but starting there, you you speak at like many, 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 many schools. It was it's unbelievable, yeah. and like tons of different. Uh, tons and tons of different whether it's forums or events or shows or come speak to this class or this corporate culture like you're on it and i love that you're giving back to education yeah, sharing information but also you have alas so it's artists legal advice services paul right. co-founded this and what people can call you and just say hey i need advice legally is that how like how does that work yeah that artists of all disciplines throughout ontario can contact Alas. Um, the website is www.alasontario.ca. A L A S Ontario.ca. Yeah, and uh, it's about to be updated. Hopefully, come the fall, but it's still functional now. You call and book an appointment. In fact, I'm going to be there tomorrow night. Cool. Doing three sessions. So, um, free book, free book in advance. Would you say somebody who's got the deal but doesn't maybe have the liquidity to go to a lawyer would go to the last to yes. see where they're standing? I've been saying for years now, especially when I teach at Metalworks or anywhere else, I'll often bring out business cards. I think but I still have one of those actually. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I'm saying, I know where it is. One of the biggest mistakes you can make is to not stick your hand up and get some information. Ask a question. So anyone in Ontario should feel confident that they can get skilled legal advice from a lawyer in the arts field because of a lapse. So yes, it's a half hour for free. Uh, you may need something beyond that, and often you do, but at least you've got oriented. Sometimes the summary advice service, uh, that half hour is, is enough. So but the half hour also gives you that access to know that there is so much right. more to be had for right. yourself and you're there to help them with that free half hour That's conversation. And direct them elsewhere if they if uh, if they uh, if they if so be it. Yeah, absolutely. counsel or, or if they don't need counsel, other places. Yeah. So I've been saying that for a while, yeah. No one should be afraid to look up and try and get some advice. It's free. I mean no, having said that, we ask for a twenty dollar donation, but you don't have to give it. That that's one's that they're gonna, that's shame, they're gonna that's, shame you yeah. with the, the, the bell like in Game of Thrones. If you don't pay the twenty, they ring the bell no. and they <laughs> No, but that's how we sell fun. Yeah, how we oh, you have a very minimal budget. We're fortunate to we work out of the access copyright offices, they supply that for free. The lawyers do the work for what they call pro bono, i.e. free. I've uh, been on the board since 1986 when it was founded, wow. that's all free. Wow, that's, that's coming up on 30 years now, 33 years. Yeah, three years over three, yeah. Over three. Wow. And we celebrated our 30th a few years back. And, cool. and the UAT law students that do the reception are all volunteer. Really cool. But they gain valuable, obviously, Yes, law. they get, they get, they learn how to see how a lawyer uh, deals with legal issues in the arts. So they learn kind of by uh, vicariously. Uh, and, and it's uh, with consent of the client. The client can say, no, I don't want someone sitting in. But they often say yes. Yeah. And that's how law students learn. And um, that's how one way um, I treat this as a profession and I, I give back. That's cool. Well, I was in the trenches, right? I oh, was in true, yeah. You were a musician. And you were there. Yeah, wow, I'm going to watch someone to go. Hey, yeah. <laughs> but that's how that's how well, every management deal. That's how every sign. great thing started. Yeah, you were there. You saw there was a need for it. You became the need that well, fills the hole. I wanted to mention what Carter was mentioning. Um, when I was working as a second year law student in between second and third years of summer job, I worked for Carfax Ontario, and the executive director there. That's a visual art uh, advocacy association. The executive director there <clears throat> was on the phone much of his day, as he as then was, um, answering legal questions, mostly copyright and contractual issues that affected artists. So went, man, this is a waste of your time. And first of all, you're not a lawyer. Yeah. So now you're giving legal, legal advice. And that's where the idea of um, the artist legal advice Career services, the, 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 the idea came. And I, after I wrote the book, two years later, um, then focused on setting this up and co-founding it, and it took us about a year, but 
we haven't looked back. It's been running ever since. That's awesome. And so it's, it's kind of like fantastic. a collaboration of lawyers who are doing, yeah. and then lawyers who doing... often practice in the field. We we Wanted have some back. incredible people on Huge. the board. I mean, really cool. There's my my um, equivalent in the film field. I think Winnie Duarte. He does film law. Marion Hab, who is also a co-founder. She's an expert in artist uh, publishing agreements. Um, we have a couple of people from Bereskin and Parr who are IP experts. Really cool. And 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 more. Like these are the same people that you will see. Most of them that will be there doing giving the advice. They care about art. And an artist, and they want to be there helping. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't, I can't give that enough praise for myself. For whatever it's worth, from the one Carter guy, like that's going to be awesome. Maybe we'll even use it here at Drivewire and be like, hey, how can yeah. we cover our own buns? <laughs> <laughs> how can we figure this all out? Like, I, I definitely appreciate having a place to go. So again, alasontario.ca, www.alasontario.ca. Right. That's going to be able to be where you find it. You also have a band called the Blue Room. I do. I want to talk about that a little bit. How uh, long has the band happy, been together? Happy to do that. Uh, well, uh, over 20 years. Uh, Woo! 1996, 97, 97. That's like the same year Dom was born or something like that. I did not even it, get a smile out of his face it, on it that one. <laughs> it takes a while to learn how to play the blues well. That's for sure. You think it's easy. No, it sounds I, easy. I don't, I don't it's think not. It, it's that. <laughs> Things that are simple aren't often easy. Oh, I like that. And then figuring it out versus mastering it. Some right. Some I think we just, we just uh, in 2014, we did our fourth album, and I went, I think we're finally we're starting finally to sound it. like some people <laughs> want to sound like. And so when do we get the fifth? <laughs> I'm hoping to start recording in the studio this fall. Really? Oh, yeah. so that's awesome. So next year, then, I mean, we can expect yeah. the whole, uh, we can expect the, the true sound. Well, yes. And I'm hoping uh, that the songwriting shows some growth. I wrote most, wrote most of the material. And, oh, uh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, and uh, it's a little different. Yeah, different, so. Paul, just for anybody who has never sat in a class with <laughs> Mr. Sainz, <laughs> every single class, or almost every single class, there's a guitar involved. He's like singing you the lesson, you know, you get to you get to hear about the sunset clause while there's a one, four, five blues progression playing noise. <laughs> I invented something recently. Really? Or, or coined it, yeah. Okay. How about the sunrise clock? The sunrise clock. <laughs> How early <laughs> my payments <laughs> start happening? <laughs> no, it has to do with burning <laughs> into the, the to the sunset. Okay. Right. So if you're with a manager, say for five years, uh, uh, it, you know, you, you get if you left after the first year, they may only get a five percent sunset. Ten years, uh, sorry, the next year ten percent, right? So. 15% of three years and four years and beyond, you can start your sunset at 20%. Oh, that's really cool. So yeah. just so no. just so people yeah. are proper, do you know what a sunset clause is? Nope, I was just gonna, <laughs> I was gonna majority, sit here, look cute, and just show them out. <laughs> people don't, and neither did I until I spoke to Paul at Metalworks. So do you wanna just kind of give it out? Why, what, what, what are some of the clauses, including a sunset, that people might yeah. want to have in an agreement and why? Well, a sunset clause is specifically very very industry specific to the management agreement so gotcha. a manager will typically want post-term commissions that's really what it is so that's the so-called sunset why it's called a sunset because they typically decline over a period of time so a typical one might be if they're at a 20 percent commission 20 percent for the first year 15 percent for the second year 10 percent for the third year five percent for the fourth year and then zero thereafter. So post-term commissions, what I'm, I'm just gonna kind of break it down real simple. If I'm your manager and you're the artist and I help you to gain how X number of dollars a year and my commission working for you while I'm, during the agreement, that's during the term, mm -hmm. the sunset dictates this is how we are gonna taper off your earnings over time. Because a lot of times right. a manager might say, dude, mm -hmm. I worked for you for four years to get you to this position and now that our contract's done, you have all this earning coming that I helped you get, and I think there's a fair amount of... Well, like, that would be the manager's perspective. You know Some I mean. managers insist that there be no sunset, and therein lies the negotiation. Right, so now all of a sudden they're saying, look, I want 20% in perpetuity, so yeah. forever so, kind of thing. Well, if, if that's the case, then another way you can deal with it, you can, you can restrict it to certain sources of income, for example. Ooh. Not live and not merge, but the recordings are recordings. done during the term yeah. only. And you better record and release, getting that those nuances. And the songs that were recorded 
on those recordings that recorded and released. So oh one my gosh. So once I click yeah. that little subcategory, oh, there's nine more little arrows that I'll have nine little arrows. Yeah, again, it sounds simple when you start to blend these concepts. Yeah. They're not so They're simple. Not simple. Especially if you're blending in a sunrise with a sunset. So what you want to see, what you want to avoid is being an artist who is being who is commissioned at 20%, and that's on a go forward basis with the past manager, and then right. adding another 20% yeah. with the new manager, and you're giving your 40%. So that's uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Let's yeah. so let's say Crawford does it. I'm his manager. <laughs> I rip him off. Dom comes in. He's the manager. Or maybe I don't buy it. Maybe maybe I just manage to get my 20%, and I, I actually earn it. But then I'm in perpetuity, and he's messed up. Dom does the I, same I, thing. I, he signs I, on I, as his I, new I, manager. Dom's getting 20%. So now he's giving up 40%, I, but he obviously doesn't want to do that. Is there any recourse? Like, can you now we're tra talking about breaking contracts? Like yeah. you're talking about. Well, well okay. that's where you want to negotiate or. It's all, I, I look at it this way, a management agreement with an artist is much like a, like a marriage, if you will. So you want to negotiate for the divorce, i.e. the sunset. Prenup. Sign as, prenup. As, as <laughs> before you sign the management deal. That's the ideal time for the artist. So, so you're saying like, so you're have an exit strategy. That, yeah, there may be another manager, and you don't really want to be giving away more than X, whatever that is, for, for the artist. 40% of gross is a lot of money. That's a lot. So, too much. Uh, let's talk about overall income. So, a lot of artists that I speak to have no idea that they're going to need a team. So, then they start developing a team and they're like, well, sh shit, man. Like, my income is 20% uh, is going to this guy and 10% here yeah. are points and what are points and I'm over my head. Right. How much of the income generated on my art can I actually expect to keep as an artist? Uh, well, and once again, it depends uh, how how good of a negotiator. Yes, are you? that and, and uh, what percentage of, have you given up to get where you're going? Remember, you got to give up the something to get recording something. Recording studio, exactly. right? You got the producers, the studio, yeah. the time, the people, the bands, and the, right. your label. So, yeah. There's a, two different scenarios, very different. If you're a signed band, that's that's a set of ratios and percentages that would be common. We can talk about that. If you're an independent and, and the, that is possible these days, you keep 100% less whatever your distributor or you have, you have no management. So you're saying like, how much? How many pe people? How much do you, you deem yourself piece in? Gotcha. That. that actually makes a lot of sense because I, I know a lot of musician friends and I've seen a lot of them doing all self produce things from their own. They're all helping yeah, each other record sure. and produce yeah. it, mix it, edit it, release it. Yeah. They're all helping each other do CD prints and release yeah. it, shows and everything. Because they're not trying to release any of that money. They're trying to make it all for themselves to become yeah. something to get to that point, obviously, sure. where we could meet with the recording uh, artist or I mean the recording. Yeah, I still recorder. think there's a real uh, need and value for, for labels, uh, but it's changing. Um, they still are looked at as assistant as part of the team to promote. And they can often do it better than that's what they do, right? So well, the best yeah. thing you can have on your CD is a water stamp, right? What do you, right. Yeah. What do you think? Those and and the money to record it. Yeah, true. So they're they're going to continue to be that um, financing and promoting, right? So, but how deeply you want to go into that more conventional, uh, you know, artist signed uh, artist people's things. I mean, a lot depends on the genre you're in too. If you're in a yeah. more niche genre, that's huge. Why? Why? Why would you want to go that route? Yeah. And why would you? Again, major so much labels for... excel at certain types of music, more mainstream music. True. They're going to go for you know the pop and the hip hop, the big big sales. Yeah, that's, that's that was actually something we discussed a couple of weeks ago and uh, with uh, Mr. Deeds, where he said like there was the producers that just produce. The bangers, the mainstream yeah, ones sure. that are really just, they're just, they're not good, but it's what the people are going to listen to, you know? <laughs> that's, you know? Well, that's that a is a Crawford opinion, yeah, not a Drivewire opinion. opinion. No, that's right. Yeah, he <laughs> didn't, didn't say that Drivewire is a whole thing, that, but it's, it's yeah. just what the music, it's, it's, what, it's what we see. Yeah. Okay, I, I've been, I have two questions that I've been really just delaying, but I really am excited for your answer. So, um, in in terms of monetizing, the word precarious comes to mind. Have you seen any strange ways, but interesting ways to actually earn on art, like whether it's musical or visual or anything like that? Have you seen anything that you're like, oh, shit, that's unique? Hmm. 
or nothing comes to mind. Nothing immediately comes to mind. Okay, if it pops up, please cut me oh, off because yeah, I just really, if, yeah, if there's one thing like, oh yeah, they did that thing and it actually worked, I, well, I would love to know. There's lots of creative tie-ins that kind of, you know. Can um, you name a couple? Um, again, um, I'm thinking more conventional ones, you know. And I'm thinking more, not in, so independent, but you know, when there used to be a CD of sampler that where you, you, you buy a case of beer and you get the CD with it. Those tie-ins, right? Or, or, those or, were or, you know, a lot That's of just independence. The giveaways, artists, though, yeah, the free yeah, but a lot of independents will take that type of mindset and um, especially if they're doing some type of crowdfunding, you know, they'll, they'll have a structure whereby A, B, C, D, right? You buy in this much, you get yeah, the this reward. You know, yeah, the, the download with a t-shirt or, you know, you get uh, us backstage, uh, you know, a mean greet, or phone you get, call with the band, or yeah, or you get like the, yeah, a, yeah. a personal performance, yeah. I mean, all so those types of things. And bands tend to be looking at outside the box too. You know, uh, one of the bands uh, that is independent, um, surprisingly enough, uh, and they're in the blues community. They, they uh, a band called Coots Paradise, who are friends of, of our band, uh, did a. a um, Perfume fragments that's Whoa. unisexual and going. Awesome. You wouldn't think of that. You would blues never, band, would you? Well, how do you how do you <laughs> make your that's own perfume? Of, like, <laughs> where do I start on that? That's like, <laughs> they went to a friend that designed it, and, just, they, and they did they it. tied it in. Yeah. So there's all sorts of those creative things that are possible. I oh, really suspect cool. with so one thing that I'm gonna as I figure this out, I want to bring this right on on air, or even release this online, whatever, however it goes. Um, like shirts and lines of clothes. I'm yeah. seeing a huge Merch. number of, and what's really cool is with the internet, the advent of the, the way that it's coming on, I don't have to buy a shirt from you before I sell it to you. I can create it online, you right. can pay me for it, and then I can go to the, the you know what I mean, like destruction. It. Yeah. Sure. It's definitely a little bit more expensive yeah. of a way to move, but I, I'm thinking that <laughs> with the creativity, a lot of artists might be able to kind of set up the system to yeah. earn on it. Oh, well, yeah, that. you're right, merch is very, very important, um, even at an independent level. Now, once again, genre specific, because not a lot of classical or jazz musicians sell t-shirts, for example. And I would love a t-shirt with just a grand piano on it and just, you know, like the pianist, you know, but no, well, that's, you know, it's, not. yeah, exactly, it's not. On the other hand, if you're in a, you know, a more, a genre that, that's more commonplace, that makes the difference between getting the next gig and putting gas in the van and oh, yeah. eating pizza that night, yeah. or not, so it's a big deal. Uh, yeah. And everything up, I mean, the, 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 the numbers on merch are, once you, have a celebrity status or just my mind well that's what i was gonna say there's actually a video i stumbled on youtube the other day with like uh, that uh, the jackass star steve-o he had this young teenager kid on like 19 years old this kid's in like a two million dollar mansion in la he's got all these nice things and you know steve's yeah. like how'd you make all your money how are you so famous how'd you get this big he's like man honestly merch yeah. i just sell things people just buy it and it's yeah. got my face and my name yeah. and everything on it and i make Bold well, there was one from recently, that just yesterday, just speaking to my son about it, uh, Travis Scott did a, a cereal box. It was sold out. Like, like that? Yeah. Well, the, I said the Andy Samberg movie Pops, there, they got, uh, they got uh, like, uh, ASAP Rockies. He's got ASAP, like, Shreddies or something like that. There you go. It is, a, it is a, one of those jokes, but it's also so meant so seriously and oh, so yeah. branded. Well, and Yeah. New, new Kids in the block at their peak were made a billion dollars in merch. Yeah, yeah, that's you true. Know, yeah, on, on, and if you're in a start, but with a B, with a B, a billion, a billion, a billion. That's billion. not a million, billion, like 10, 10, 10, yeah, yeah. 10 digits. We're gonna yeah, have to yeah. get a merchandising person. <laughs> <on the phone>. <laughs> <laughs> We've had ideas. We've had ideas. Yeah. We've had sponsorship. Ideas. But it's look at it this way. Let's yeah. say you're a superstar now. You're down at the Rogers Center. You're you got fifty five merch tables. You got you got fifty thousand people. On average, about thirty percent will buy merch. Okay. Wow. So how many is that out of fifty? So, so fifteen thousand, right? Fifteen thousand and times thirty forty dollars. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Well, and I know when the the Foo Fighters actually night night stumbled night. on it. And I guess they and if you do three nights in a row in one city. And uh, it's what the Foo Fighters did last year. They came, and for every city they did, they released exclusive city bobhead, bobbleheads. 
So each design for the six cities they did yeah. were a different design, and they were over a hundred dollars a piece, and every single show sold out of them. And that right there, how much money was made in that? How many did they make for each show? You know, this, like this is the kind of creative creative marketing that I think is really, really cool. And um, if we could get creative minds thinking like that on a larger scale, oh man, with the change. distribution well, available change. for the it's internet, it's it change. ties in and it's, and it's done with integrity. So it can, yeah, let's and tell you. Is huge. Integrity. Otherwise, you're probably devaluing what you do. But mm -hmm. yes. What do you mean by that? So you said well, it has integrity and has if value. If it's just like, so like a- You just release it you know, to release it. And, and it's so, Far and, and you. you know, so make the best music you can. Oh yeah, for sure. But but then once you've got fans, they want more, right? Yeah, so, consistency. So yeah, consistency. This is saying in marketing that I, I, I learned. You sell them till they say stop. True. We saw what happened when Eminem released that real bad relapse album or whatever. The fans turned against him, and everybody didn't like him for a very yeah, you know, a couple of years there until they released a new album. People were like, "Oh, you know, he was just in a bad time or whatever." Now he's back on the up. But it'd be like but, the same thing. Walking into a clothing men's clothing store and you bought a suit, and they said, and they and they said, "Well, we got a shirt too." Oh yeah, I need a shirt. Yeah, I need a shirt too. Hey, how about a tie? Yeah. And, and if they didn't ask good. that, are they doing their are job? They doing their job. Yeah. The same thing here in music. How much more does a fan want? You don't know until you ask. Yeah, and like at that know. point as well, and then they will tell you once, yeah, once enough, you're done something. Yeah, we're but otherwise, you know, some fans are, bring it on. Bring yeah. it on, yeah, yeah, we, we want all of it. Yeah, we yeah, want yeah. anything. What, yeah. what do you ask you got? That's kind of similar yeah, to the, that's we want the VIP pick. We exactly, get exactly, yeah, we want, we want the, the garbage exclusive. backstage and hanging out with the band. Yeah. And we want to hear the other garbage, you know, so you mentioned on the way here, you were like, uh, best estimates for the Grateful Dead was only 33% of their stuff was yeah, awesome yeah, and the other 66% <laughs> that was their jams so, <laughs> the, their jams their jams <laughs> they they said it, they said it. It. yeah so um, perhaps really their fans still wanted to hear the next one even if it was well, lackluster yes of course because you never know when the, and there's the chance through. that it's going to be on. exactly and, 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 and I want to be there when they're, they're really on I don't want to miss out well yeah. this is a good I, I think this is a great example Tom Petty has passed at this point so we won't ever hear any new Tom Petty but would we not love to hear some of the old unreleased music that they didn't yeah. think ever was good enough because maybe you know we've been Tom Petty fans you know if you're yeah. not Tom Petty fans sure. crazy, but we for how long you know for over 30 years now there's no way that you could, you might hear songs and go like them, but it's the, it's the whole, I'm almost like, relationship factor that yeah. they... I think he has a post-humous release. Really? Yeah. yeah so up. there is a new one going to be coming up this yeah, year, possibly. So. Oh, and you're right. There, there's got to be incredible amounts in, in the vault. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like the Prince. I believe there was yeah. someone Prince passed. Oh, they yes. said there was like... And Michael Jackson. And yeah. Michael Jackson yeah. as well. You know, it's and just... Steve Miller band, apparently. They had oh, a thing. Oh, oh really? I heard at Metal Works, I don't know if it was in your class or someone else, but they said uh, that Steve Miller band, it was... Oh, what's his name? Rod Roger? Was, uh, oh, oh, man. Ron. Ron, Ron, love that guy. Ron yeah, Rogers, Ron. Yeah. love that guy. He is like, man. Apparently, uh, the the band Steve Miller band, they hated their label and they had all this buried music oh, and they really wow. got it and they were angry and they and they so in order to like they took the hit by not releasing it but they didn't give their label any more of their music by just keeping it off. So well, it comes back to like, the money right there, right? Because how much money can they make? One hundred percent. How many people are on that? If let's go back to the deal. Let's yeah. Let's, Let's assume you you have enough bargaining power that you those outtakes are yours. Yeah, you own those, right? Those are all not yours. the label. So how do you gain the leverage? Uh, if I'm new and you're the one with all the money and the power and the whatever, what leverage do I possibly have to say, no, Paul, I want all the outtakes? <laughs> well, first of all, you don't get them, you don't ask. And number two, your bargaining power is presumably they're interested in you or they wouldn't have made an offer. That's true. Uh, and, uh, also, uh, your ability to say no, that's your bargaining power when you're when first starting out. If you can't say no, yeah, then your bargaining power diminishes. If you gotcha. really need it and or really want it, and sign the same you sign yeah, then you're going to cut the best deal you can. Yeah, yeah, sure. Here's a book, here's a pencil. We want all your money, though. <laughs> How badly do you want it? Uh, well, I, I'll give you all my money today. Often, I, very few artists will walk away from a deal. Well, it is so hard to get a deal as well, right. right? You fight so hard for so long yeah. to just get that 15 minute meeting. 
yeah. to sign that piece yeah. of paper to get yeah, into absolutely. this huge business. It's, so yeah. that you cut the best deal you can, you live with. But yeah. you might be able to keep outtakes. Keep yeah. Sides. What are the... Maybe. That's in the paperwork. That's in the fine print. So the negotiations. That's the negotiations. That's it. That's it. You need to know what to ask for. Though. Do you think True. too high of a number of people like just don't even ask. make any addendum? Like they don't just change anything. They just sign it and just move on? Or well, I think do? some most artists these days and it's not like even if you went back 10, 20 years ago, most artists are savvy enough that when they've got a deal that's serious, they'll, they'll get counsel. Uh, how far and aggressively they're negotiated, that's another matter. And Well, you don't want to poke a sleeping bear too much. Right. Is that the mindset? mindset? Which they call a comfort level. Yeah. We can do this, and as a lawyer, my job is to set out all the options. So this you is, tell me, you yeah. instruct me, you're the principal, I'm the agent. Right, I'm acting in your behalf. True, true, true. You're paying me. To, and, uh, and, and I'll give you a read on how far do you think we can go. Well, here's what, I, and especially if you've been dealing with other sides, counsel, and the label before, then you've got a pretty good idea, probably, so, where their comfort level is. So now you're paying for that yeah. expertise, and it's faster too, right? Okay, here's where you can try that, and I'll take your instructions if you want to do that. But I think but. here's where we're gonna go, and here's where we got last time, and. This one was a definite no, and I don't think we'll get it again. We're not going to get this one. That's no. not even trust. So for. yeah, concede that one and aim for this one over here. Interesting. Yeah. Well, it's best. Oh. Love. Love. I feel Incredibly like I'm, information. I feel like I'm looking at like a master architect, and but yeah. I'm just like I'm yeah. like trying to sort it all out, and there's so many moving parts of what it's you more do. More like magician. Yeah, I really believe Here's that. Here's a nine, but now it's all. So, what, I, what I think I is it's in your head, though. That's what's yeah, so cool yeah. about this like oh, this conversation is it's it's creative to the ability of your own creative ability. It's like if I can law can be creative too. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, can be creative. It looks very much so like that. So I think I think at the very nature we all are creative in some ways. I do. So negotiation can be highly creative and and looking for. Uh, solutions outside of the box, but it's like I said, used to say in class, we would study in a box. Okay, there's the record deal, there's the producer deal, mm. there's the publishing deal, there's the merch deal. There's the merch deal. Yeah. Now, if you're an expert, you throw them all together because they're often a hybrid, and you the they're box. all up in the air. Yeah. And yeah. you play with that as yeah, much like a juggler. Okay, okay. Boom, got that one, <laughs> got that one, move on, you know? And so you gotta play with it all. That's cool. It's just, you like learning one scale. No, no, you got, you gotta go out there and jam. You need a few more on your belt unless you're gonna just play in one, one key. Ride one the scale. one, ride the one, ride <laughs> the one. You, you can do that, so, but most of the times you want a little more. Yeah, I counted to 10 in grade two, and that's as far as I really counted. Oh, so it's like, <laughs> ride the one, We can ride make the music one. out of that too. You can, you can. <laughs> And sometimes simplest is best. All right, speaking of Ride the One, although I don't think Jeff Healy rides the one. <laughs> Roadhouse Blues by Jeff Healy as well as Burn by Drop Top Alibi coming up here on CFRE. Welcome back. <laughs> CFRE, drive wire radio. Yeah, I heard, yeah, that's too loud. Too loud. Too loud. Too loud. Too loud. Just get, get hyped up. Listen, we were talking about. So I'm just gonna recap and then go right back into that because we were on a cool vein. Paul was talking about um, he was speaking to somebody who he was representing, a really, really yeah. elite, talented, probably yeah. like gold or platinum record. I'm not gonna talk about, it, but but Paul was saying this person said. Listen, man, you don't have to spend two, three hours playing guitar every day. Just do 10, 15 minutes. So Paul was talking yeah. about, okay, in the morning I do 15 minutes on piano and on guitar. Maybe more if I really feel the vibe, if I get into flow. If not, before I go to bed, 15 minutes, reprogram the brain. And then at the very yeah. end, he said, it's like get that left and right hemisphere talking to each other. That made me start thinking about something I read where they had shown through uh, musicians who have passed away and, and also MRI scans of people playing music, the, the part of their brain that connects the right and the left hemisphere, that highway of information between the two sides, is three times larger in musicians than in non-musicians oh. over the course of their life. <laughs> so what, it, what it's been able to do is really cool because when I started taking music super seriously, I felt this shift in the way that I was in, interpreting things. 
and my memory increased. So what, what wow. one thing that happens is you can start to associate more things with one. So instead of just remembering, you know, the color of this water bottle, I'm going to actually remember what I was smelling at the time, who was around me. You wow. start to, and it's because both sides of the brain are just You're communicating at this right. increased bandwidth. Very cool, man. Huge, huge, huge benefits. Well, to talk, like, what, as I mentioned, we want to talk about after the show, but I'd be really interested to know. That, what, that's what I'm saying, saying for injury. you. That's yeah. why I brought that whole thing up. Yeah, 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 it's it's a whole other area of study. study. So one thing I want to say that's yeah. kind of a parallel to that, been lots of research because of the increase of dementia and Alzheimer's of music on the brain. Yeah. And, and there are studies that show that people are basically that cannot talk when they reconnect through music that they typically are of their youth, it reconnects the, the brain neurons so that they actually are humming along, I mean, yeah. maybe singing, Whoa. maybe even talking again, and then when the music stops, Scott, back yeah. down to not being able to speak. Well, so that's a phenomenal really great. Impact. Interesting yeah. enough, that's really one cool. of the things I was told yeah. was when I was actually in my coma, I believe yeah. they had they had showed me that they, they exposed me to music, and it was like one of those things that Wow, it, it kind of ends up, you know, it, it, I, I've seen, uh, uh, and I, I, I read this daily too, the, the post of musical things by Alan Cross. He's uh, phenomenal. Times he's, he's posted, yeah, he's posted, uh, yeah, great guy, and he's done a lot of keynotes at Metalworks, uh, Metal yeah. and did some teaching there too. But anyway, he, he sh in his uh, in his post sometimes he, he will show that they'll have a, a musician uh, playing their instrument so that they. When they're doing brain surgery, oh, brain surgery, oh, yeah, brain yeah. surgery. Yeah, make sure we didn't screw up the wrong one. <laughs> Is it still working? <laughs> Seriously? No, I've seen. What, I've the seen. Brain open? Yeah, yeah, I've seen. Uh, I, I, I don't remember clicking the video, but I remember because I get, uh, I get uh, really uh, real ah uh, about that stuff. I but it's you. like seeing a picture and they're like as you say they're performing the back of the guy's skull is off yeah and he's sitting there yeah. conscious playing a guitar and you're like and it's just get brain out of here yeah. like yeah. i want to be out for my brain surgery yeah. i was out for my brain surgery and but they I needed was it for to the where they were doing the surgery exactly want to be in the wrong section of the brain you're like oh that's, that's not the right note for. jimmy that was yeah. uh, that's that's not the too on the nose <laughs> <laughs> maybe they are i don't know i'm really <laughs> sorry for all of the squeamish <laughs> listeners like myself, there's well, I hate me. we'll post a picture of my face, whatever that was <laughs> on Instagram because it was uh, pretty rough there. Okay, so open brains and playing guitar. I'm gonna ask you a law question now because I'm getting squeamish. There's lots of legal issues there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go there though. Yeah, yeah, not my urge. That is really interesting. Um, I, I, I don't know, I'm very grateful for music and the, and the way that I've perceived it, and it's been in my life. I have a question about the sneaky clauses. Is there a particularly like? Is there one that's particularly sneaky that you would well, like to yeah, call Yeah, when you when you first uh, sent me an email with that, uh, there are two, uh, and and I see it from both sides because I, I represent production companies and I represent artists. Got gotcha. you. The one of the artists most dislike is the cross collateralization, which means. Basically, it's an accounting concept where all money goes into a pot till all recoupable costs are recouped, and that's the industry standard. So from the artist's perspective, that's not great. You want to separate and have streams of income that will flow through to you so you can try and make your living. From a business perspective, especially as a, an, uh, an independent, you haven't made your money back. So you want to cross collateralize. You want all incomes from all streams to go to recoupment. Okay. So therein that lies attention. So, so it means it means cross collateralization. So if I'm the artist and you're the label and it costs us five thousand dollars to make this music video and promote it and everything, even if so what's the artist be, like what's the best way in the artist's view? What could they negotiate for and said, Look, no no no, I'm putting my hundred bucks, I wanna the first hundred bucks are mine, and then I get my money back in the future. No, uh, and what they'd want to try and do is uncross certain streams. So, for example, if it was a 360 or a multi rights deal, and there's music publishing and merchandising, and maybe even live involved, take one of those out, out of there so that it's free and clear and not being used to cross collateralize and pay so, back. The, so, saying, okay, look, I'm going to sign this deal with you. I like it, but right. you guys can only have the income from merch and recordings, and I'm going to take 100% of the income from my live or a portion thereof just for me. Right. With forget your collateralization. Right. 
do you have enough leverage to ask for that in a deal, or are you just going to get shut down regardless, or does it depend on who you are? Like it really depends. Yeah, so like it depends on, 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 well, it depends so on, on how good you, you are <laughs> negotiating. Like. The, the label depends <laughs> on the business model, too. Yeah. Fair. Fair. If they don't have the money, then they're going to go, no, we can't yeah. afford that. And it's a judgment call of whether it makes sense to work on that. But there is another clause that I thought of when this question was raised. There's what's called a re-record restriction. And the industry standard, and it's very standard, uh, five years from the date of making that master, two years from the date of the expiration or termination of the agreement, whichever is longer. I came across, and no names mentioned this, in, in, with an independent label, where there was a perpetual re-record restriction, which meant you could never re-record those masters ever again because they're owned by the label. Wow. That probably fits within your uh, yeah that's really sneaky sneaky. That's so, so, so what it was just one more reason why that deal didn't go what, down but that was what like, would uh, this mean yeah team. because look as soon as i feel like you're trying to take advantage of me i'm out like i'd rather I, just I get knew. with different people you know, so i gotta see why yeah. they would do that um the the back end so that would kind of mean like look if you if you have like a oh let's say don mclean's american pie if they if he had signed this no release, is that saying like he would never be able to have the greatest hits without the permission or probably royalties to that company because they would just say no 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 you well not so much the greatest hits because they could use the original master but he couldn't re-record it and re-release it on his own after a period of time. So the one that's out is the one that's out. Period. Until he can never re-record it. Never. Not even if he goes back to that label company. No. Never. Just never. No. That's the one. Not even if it goes into the public domain. Why does it matter? <laughs> oh. what, so, so it just means that that person, so that record label then, is gonna forever be the one who's earning the royalties on the. Correct. On the well, song, and the artist too, because they they share. They would have to split. So, as royalty. an artist, why does it why does it matter then? Well, uh, what often happens if you've had some success early in your career, um, ideally, number of hits then you'll, you have the right to record them later and keep all the income. God, so you can just sell under yourself for a higher quality God. Lots of artists yeah, 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 yeah. have done that because they may be forever on recoup with the label. They go out and take their hits, re-record them again that's 10, huge. 20 years later. That's huge. And the, all the income from that is theirs. Because that's the right. Theirs. Got you. But if you're under a perpetual re-record, no. And, and I ever. truly think in law that may be very questionable, may be so restrictive as to be unenforceable, but no one's ever tested it yet. And most uh -oh. most uh, labels will go with the industry standard. Right. Five years from the date of making, or two, two years from the date of expiration termination agreement, which it was later. That's standard. So, again, let's just not... Long enough. Let's you have an exclusive right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's, yeah. A, that's a decent it's, amount of time. It is. If I'm offering you that deal, Perpetual re-record clause can't do it ever. The problem that I have with this is that I'm probably just going to give you the stuff, and it's up to you to find it. You know, like, it, is it an offer that's going to be like, yo, by the way, this is something that we want to do up front. Here you go, perpetual no re-record. We need that deal happening. Or are they just giving you? A stack of pages in a contract, and you have to dig through and oh my god, perpetual <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. We don't want to do this. Find now, a small front now. But, you know what I mean? Because are they hiding it? Are they trying to hide it and just hoping that I don't find well, it? It's not necessarily hidden, but bear in mind, every single word has a meaning in a contract. Well, a contract, just like every single word in a song should have a meaning, or it shouldn't be there, right? So you got to read the whole contract. And some of these are quite lengthy. I mean, so yeah, it feels like finding a needle in the haystack, but it's just due diligence reading. Now, some of these contracts will take me, and I'm, I'm an expert. I've been reading these for decades. Uh -huh. You know, how long does it take you to read a 70, 80, 100 page well, recording agreement with multi rights? 360 degree model. A couple hours, and guess what? Even with all my expertise, First of all, it's boring. It's true. <laughs> it really is. Then you got to read it again because it's like it's like when you learn a passage of music. Do you play it well the first time? No. It takes 20 times. Well, it takes a few reads yeah. to finally get it under wow. your belt. 
Yeah, and then and, and figure out, oh, these are the pressure and points. And the blending. These are the ones that yeah. we should be looking at. True. Getting instructions and, and, and then entering the negotiation. There's where it becomes interesting because now you've got the human element. But the actual paperwork is boring. And, and the other thing that you, you learn as you practice law, <clears throat> even now, someone can give me an agreement and say, read this, what do you think of it? And I'm going, wow. Looks like an agreement. Looks like an agreement. <laughs> yeah. Seems like an agreement. Don't know if it's good or bad. So I hear witness here. And, and until the facts come in, like the human element, who are you working with? What's the genre? What are their goals? Uh, you know, this does this reflect that? What have there been any pre negotiations? All that then starts to factor in, you go, oh, now this is making sense. Mm -hmm. So and they say, Well, I, for example, a simple clause. I don't want it to last more than three albums. And you read through and you go, well, this is a five album commitment. Yeah. So, okay. So, you change that. so yeah, so now, so you're saying, like, if I read five albums and I went, it's within an industry standard, is it good or bad? Well, the client needs to tell me that. Yeah. No, we only, we only want to do one record for this company. And maybe, maybe we'll give them an option if we have some success. Well, that's a whole different matter. I say that's a longer because that would be like if the one album we record has success, we will then come back and do two more with you or things of that yeah, sense. Like, yeah, yeah, and you can build those in, but you need those instructions. Yeah. You need to know what the artist's goals are. What, where do they want to go? Like, yeah, what do they want from this? Yeah, and not all artists, our artists' goals are the same. same. We don't lots, want to tour the world and make right. Not all of them do. Yeah. Lots of people think they do, and that's another question I ask them these days. I'm going, sure. have you ever stopped to think what it means to be like a Justin Bieber or a Beyonce or a Kanye West? There's 97 countries every four months, you know, a different yeah, show every day of the week. You have no life other yeah. than that. Yeah. Is that what you really want? And, you know, you know everyone wants a piece of you 24-7. Yeah. You have no privacy. No. Nope. TMZ is always I'm not there, saying yeah. there aren't perks to it. Yeah, there are. For sure, money, you know, friendships. But, but it's, you uh, lose percentage. something to get that. Yeah. From you, pay your, you sacrifice a lot. Yeah. So it this is totally going to be a guess. I'm going to say that to you before I ask this question. <laughs> from your perspective, the number of people that come to you and say they want that, but you're yeah. like, in your head, you're like, probably you actually don't. Do you think people, like... I think most people think they want it. But they... But, but, how, but how, how many do you think actually do? Yes. I said absolutely. How many? Because it's what you think it is. It's a right. mirage. Yeah. Right. It's not real. It's, a, when they it's get a perception. There, it's and you only see the 5% of the time, if they're lucky, that they're on stage and it looks like fun. Right. Or the highlight fun. moments they choose to show online in their personal to show right. that this life is luxury when you know you don't yeah, see the 19 hours. You don't see the, you know, see the other 95% of what yeah. it takes to, to get on that stage. 14 hour flight, like you know, a, a meals yeah. on wheels or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It almost takes a certain level of self honesty. Like you really have to know what you're looking at. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. And then the question is, is if you could be that honest, what would you do instead if you actually realize, hey, maybe I don't want well, that? Well, here's one. what I say. <clears throat> Not to discourage anyone. I don't. That's your decision. But I, I, I say you, you literally have to be obsessed with it. And if nothing else will do, then you're in the right place. We gotta get Brendan Bay on the show. Yeah. He's Otherwise, success. You're, you're probably not gonna have the yeah. stamina or the perseverance. You gotta have the push. You gotta have the con the constant yeah. want, the drive. Every minute of your life is what you're this is what you're thinking of. Yeah. That's interesting. Point. You're obsessed with it. And that's and that's I guess the good kind of obsession to have. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And if that's what turns you crank, and that's who you want to be, great. You're in the right place. In the right Go place. For it. Keep Absolutely. going. But lots of people fall by the wayside. It gets too hard. It's ten times harder than you ever think it is. Yeah. It just is. It just did. That's just the facts of the, the actual... Because it is a career, in a sense. It's oh, not yeah. just a hobby that you and just pick up your time. In a lot of ways, you know. it's gotten harder, too, because you're now expected to be your own manager, your own booking agent, your own social media guru, your own publicist, your own producer, your own choreographer, write all the songs. I mean, come on, there's only so many hours in a day. Yeah, I, I, it's funny, I met a gentleman actually about three weeks ago, he was from the UK, and he is, uh, he's, a he's, a performing, he's a performer, Tim Holhouse actually is his name, show Tim. Um, he travels the world essentially, he's, he said he's gone to, you know, sure. he's done the entire Canada, he's done uh, a bunch of different states in the US, he's done all of the UK, you know, he's done, uh, he's gone up in just all the different countries in that area. But he's 
He does, as he said, he does all his own bookings. He does all his own recordings with people. He does all his own writing, his music, his performing. It's all like he's a one-man driven success show. He's been doing it for like, I think he said like 25 years or something. Wow. 20, you know, over 20 years. And he's like, you know, this guy is, as you say, he lives and dreams and everything. He does his music. And it's like, that is what it takes to kind of get to that Yeah, point. that's kind of the new model. Actually. Yeah, you just be your own driving horse that leads yourself to success. You mean yeah. doing it yourself is the new model? Yes, and the way that's being done. And it's Put, much, like, much like we were talking earlier with Amanda Palmer. It's not the only model, it's just one. One of the options. Yeah. Like as you said, you come to the table with five different options. These are different options on the table. All right, Dom's yelling at me. Dom's yelling at me. Right in my ear. He's not yelling. He's not yelling at all. He's, waving, he's waving giant. Yeah, Ru okay. <laughs> he's uh, airplane dry, like pulling me into the driveway. You know what I mean? With the airplane, he's got the things in his hands. He's, he's directing me. Um, we have December by Collective Soul. We're probably going to stick another song in there that's not on this list showing up. I believe that's what's coming up, right? You yeah, know, it's December by Collective Soul. Soul. Yeah, for sure. We're going to have that coming up, going on on music. Here we go. <laughs> CMRE, Drive My Radio. I don't know why I'm getting licks like that. Catch us soon. We're coming back. Yo, you guys are always so official when it comes to the counting in, and I'm just sitting here like just ready. Chit chatting, to talk, talking, crap dinner. All right, so uh, I'm gonna recap you. Welcome I might back. put a few words in your mouth, but central air, <laughs> cut me off and tell me if I'm wrong, please. Here we go. Here we go. So you started with guitar first. You went to the school of hard knocks. I love that. I tell people all the time, dude. Like you have to go through the crappy thing before you go through the good yeah. thing. Like, I don't know. I have straight teeth, but I had to get you know do braces. And people who are fit have to go to the gym, and, and they're like. In order to become a laureate, you said seven years of like intense study. Intense in order study to become in a school. good musician, you have to put in tons of hours of like not really loving it or a rude golf swing. You have to hit a couple into the freaking lake. <laughs> you gotta bust your ass. So you really went through the hard thing. True. I love that you had a plan first. Huge deal, huge deal. Specifically, especially for artists, but anybody, man, plan first, then your route. School happened to be in your route, then you went poli sci, then you went legal, then it's just history from there. Um, so. You, you mentioned build other things other than just the production into the budget. So like marketing mm. and legal. We spoke with Drop Top Alibi. We spoke with Scott Middleton from the Cancer Bass. And we mm. talked to a couple other bands. And um, one thing that's come up repeatedly on the show is exactly that. It's like, look, man, there's a lot more to the song than the song. It sucks to kind of say that because the song has to be really good. Mm -hmm. But you well, got. But there's way more like marketing and legal. So I, I love that. I love that. Do you want to add in? No, no. I was just. I was complimenting. Okay, you mentioned Amanda Palmer with twenty five thousand fans by touring, caring, connecting, and you also mentioned couch surfing, living with the <laughs> people. Yes. I like that. So it seems like she was extraordinarily genuine. So an artist yes. can take that away. Have I would integrity. agree. We mentioned that, and it's like. By building the people who just know who you are and them having a stake in your winning, even something as, quote, small as 25,000 fans can bring in, I think I heard you say 1.2 million. That's what she got on her uh, crowdfunding, yeah. Crowdfunding. So that's a big deal. So so really, really huge, having that genuineness, being uh, like that. And uh, Amanda Palmer, was was it just called Amanda Palmer? Did you mention the audiobook or the biography? She, uh, oh gosh, yeah. Um, the Art of Asking. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. Maybe you can find it on Amazon. Yes. Maybe we're going to have an affiliate link. I'm looking at the up over there. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not we're sure. We're an affiliate link. Check the description of the video. Here's one that you said. I didn't paraphrase this one. Man, ask for help. You're like, the biggest yes. mistake someone can do is not ask for help soon enough. Yeah. Love that. Especially someone like myself. I think I would try and like do it myself and then just get annihilated and then realize I need to ask for help and come back and that would be me falling into the exact trap that I shouldn't have fallen into. Yes. So I'm glad you said that to me because I will ask for legal help fast enough. If you do decide to ask for legal help, you can go to Alas Ontario. Okay, yes. I don't even have it written down here, but it's Artist Legal Advice, Advice Services, Services. Yeah. Ontario. A L A S. Really, really cool. Free half hour if they if you need more than a half hour, they can send you to people whose race you can actually afford and get you the help you need to get your deal signed in a deal that works out for both parties. Okay, you said things that 
are simple aren't always easy. We were talking specifically about blues, but I wanted to just leave it with no context because I think it goes into a lot more than just music. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, I agree. Sign the prenup. <laughs> okay. Good advice. You did as you said that. You also <coughs> said uh, have 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 an exit strategy for the agreement. Sunset clauses, sunrise clauses. Um, understanding how we're gonna cancel this bad boy if stuff goes down the tubes. Yeah. Let's make that uh, known to everybody beforehand, so when it gets there, we can identify it and then just oh, okay, let's do all the steps in the agreement. Okay. Get creative with your outreach. You didn't say that, but you mentioned beer boxes. So you saw talk about beer boxes, perfume, and shirts in line with clothes. <laughs> really, really cool. Yeah. Anybody could do that. Yep. Yeah. But how few do? You know, there's a thing you can check out online. Mr. Nelson, a mentor, showed me one time. It's called Bling H2O. Stacey the laughs. Yeah, she smiles. So she knows what it is. Bling H2O is like um, water in champagne bottles with diamonds and gold on them and they sell them for like thousands of dollars a bottle. <laughs> That's crazy. It's really cool and people actually buy it. It's awesome. But again, it's, it's like a creative concept that anybody could have pulled off, but how few people do it. Yeah. And if you're creative, I maintain, you have the advantage in this, in this economy with the online, with everything that's available to you, you have an advantage, so let's use it. Okay, lift small weights like big weights. You didn't say that, but what you did say was, when you're a celebrity, the numbers for merch are mind-boggling. They can be, yeah. Right. So what I always say, I say this to Stacy a lot, but in our lives, if we can lift the small weights, if you have perfect form at the gym when the weights are small, then when you get to the big weights and your form is perfect, you're ready to lift them. If you can have the agreements in place with the proper numbers and percentages when you aren't famous, you can perhaps maintain the same agreement for when you are, and that... Mm -hmm. be intelligent or I don't know maybe you can get sure. an even better deal when you're famous because you're famous now more or less. <laughs> hopefully it depends on the, the legal the legal uh, how good of a negotiator there, yeah. sell them until they say stop I wouldn't have said that but I love that I really like that a lot because you're right like you don't decide what song is good or bad they do. Yep. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, even after there's a bad song, they want to hear another one. So don't necessarily stop selling the new stuff. People still have a, a hunger for more of it. Like, keep giving it out until they stop coming back. So we don't mean really sell like another it. bad song. We mean just we want another song. And, and, and that, ap bad. that applies in retail. It applies in law. It yeah. applies in business. It applies to your music. Same thing. Release a crappy flavor of Pepsi. Come back and release five <laughs> new ones, you know? Well, that didn't work, so keep going. Conference <laughs> <laughs> talking from experience there. Um, and then the last one, I have music invigorates you. That was a really cool conversation that you mentioned about people like um, being able to actually re-access parts yes. of their mind. That's really, really cool. I have no yeah. idea how it works, but hopefully we can get some hard scientists. Well, on, on that very note, uh, my dad died of dementia. He was suffered it for 10 years, and I used to play classical piano when I was at home. And I would p play when he was suffering with it, and he would start humming along. Wow. And I'm going, that's amazing. Yeah. It really works. It also works. So I don't want to take away from your father's dementia. That is a, that's really deep, what you're saying. Yeah. What I've noticed, and on a much more jovial note, in a room, <laughs> yes. in a room of people, in a room of people, if it's very <laughs> quiet, I can put like music on on my phone or whatever and slowly increase the volume and you notice if you watch, people watch while it's happening, like groups of, yeah, it bursts of uh. socialization around the room and then there's this like steady clutter of people and then you turn the music a little more and the volume and the volume, it really is an input of, it, it's really cool the energy that comes from yeah. it. And lastly you said with this, and I think this is a great place to end, and I think this is a great point, be obsessed or don't do it. Like. I, there's a really cool saying that I heard at Metalworks so that someone said, look, if you're not passionate about something, don't fake it. Because someone with actual passion is going to come along and show you up so hard because you're faking it, yeah. you can't do it. So be obsessed, get to the level where if nothing else doesn't, like if everything else doesn't matter, then you're in the right spot. Paul said it like that and I think that was a great place. All your attention. Paul, my brother, thank you so much. Seriously, man, thank you a lot You're for welcome. everything that you do. You give back to a ton of artists. You have Bill Last, which you founded in 86. Yes. Up for that. <laughs> so, literally longer than, than I've been alive, which is awesome. And you've given back Small to a ton over the years. So thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing. Hey, thank you for helping. 
You're welcome. Check it out, Alas Ontario. Check it out, Blue Room. I think it's theblueroom.com. Blueroommusic.com. No, Blueroommusic.com. Music. Thank yeah. you, Blueroommusic.com. You can also check out Falling Forward, the fourth book of poetry online. Uh, well, that's a good question. It's 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 a limited author's release only. Limited author's release. Only 40 available. Only 40 so available. who we don't know yet who those 40 people will be. And uh, the lottery? Perhaps? <laughs> no, <I laughs> Has to do with friends and yeah, other people in the poetry circle and, probably, and but you also have to get a car, I believe. It's a car. <laughs> it's a Toyota or a real like because I'm really stuck Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Guys, next week, <laughs> next week we are not in house. We're gonna be uh, at the, some other show going on. What's the name of the show? It's Garden the, Square. Garden, Garden, Garden Square. Square. Garden Square. Show in Brampton. Brampton. Cool. Thank you. Should I, I just get on the mic? Yeah. yeah. Honestly, if you want to, it's gonna be a sweet show. We're gonna be there. It's gonna be a lot of fun. But unfortunately, we're not gonna be in house next week. Check us the week after that. Drivewire, CFRE. Peace and love. Catch us next time.